Recording in progress. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanina Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Darine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th can Canto, and we're on chapter 21 at the level of Bhakti Vedanta. Mm. So, let me see Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm. So, maybe someone would like to tell me something they can remember from yesterday's class. Someone like to contribute something? What do you remember? Anything? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. It was such a pleasurable nectarian teachings that we hear from you and uh, the gopis' intense loving feelings towards Krishna. Being uh, women, they are shy and are not able to mix along with the uh, others in open and uh, even though they have a great desire to participate in such pastimes of how Krishna actually tends the calves in the forest but they try to become satisfied by seeing him around the bushes and behind the leaves and yet they have a deep intense appreciation especially for the dress that he is wearing and the wonderful garlands and the beauty of the Lord and they are attracted to the flute and they compare themselves to various other living entities within Vrindavan and see their own condition to be much more lower than them and they consider themselves to be less fortunate. So many of these aspects have been specifically mentioned about the birds, the peacocks and others who are more glorious than them because they have the opportunity to hear and see Krishna. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the very intense uh, exchanges which they feel amongst themselves discussing with the other gopis and their desire for such an association. Okay, thank you so much. A lot of a lot of points there. I don't know if he left anything for anybody else. Are there any remnants left? Okay, well we'll just go ahead. We're, uh, I wanted to continue text number nine. <coughs> We were talking about text number nine actually when we finished. I just wanted to go back to it. It's a, an important verse because it describes about the gopi's feeling towards the flute, particularly. I'll read the translation. My dear gopis, what auspicious activities must the flute have performed to enjoy the nectar of Krishna's lips independently? and leave only a taste for us gopis, for whom that nectar is actually meant. The forefathers of the flute, the bamboo tree, shed tears of pleasure. His mother, the river on, the, on whose bank the bamboo was born, feels jubilation, and therefore her blooming lotus flowers are standing like hair on her body. So we spoke a little about the flute, remember? What, what is the problem here actually? Why the gopis have so much uh, envy for the flute? Because the flute is enjoying the nectar from the lotus lips of Lord Krishna. 
Well, that's all right, but some other problems come up. One is that, first of all, the flute is an inanimate object. And so it indicates to the gopis, they say, he never did any, it never did any pious activities. That's why he's born in that inanimate condition. This is how the gopis argue. They say, what piety he could have done. He never did anything. He's born as an inanimate object, a piece of bamboo wood. But he's enjoying the nectar from Lord Krishna's lips. What audacity, the gopis say. So uh, they're very angry. Because, and we, the acharyas also point out that the term venu, which is used for the flute, that's of masculine gender. And that makes the gopis even more outrageous, uh, outraged about the whole thing. That he, he's in a male form and he's enjoying the nectar from the lips of Krishna. He's a gopa and we're the gopis. It should, it, this nectar from the lips should be for us to enjoy. So like this, this is the mood of the gopis, that they're feeling that they're deprived of what is actually their property. So they accuse the flute of being a thief, taking what does not belong, what is not really meant for him. And a couple of nice examples are given, oh, we're told also about the trees on the bank of the river and the river itself, that the trees on the bank of the river are like friends of the flute. They're like male friends of the flute, whereas the river is like a female friend of the flute. And the, the trees are described that their the sap is flowing from the trees. So, in, in, in the translation itself, uh, Sukadeva Gos, or the gopi is, who is speaking, is described as saying that, uh, oh, she doesn't speak about the sap which is flowing from the, but she said, the forefathers of flute, the bamboo tree, Oh, they shed tears of pleasure. Okay, they describe that they shed tears of pleasure. Pleasure in the sense that he's there, one of their family members, and he's tasting the nectar and he's doing this wonderful service for Lord Krishna to be the flute in his hands and to taste the nectar from his lips. So the, the, the sap which is flowing from the trees is compared to the tears of pleasure for the bamboo trees. But Sanatana Goswami, in the purport, Prabhupada writes, he says, Sanatana Goswami has given an, a different interpretation of this. He sees it in a different way. And he said, actually, the, the, the tree is not rejoicing, the tree is lamenting. The tree is lamenting because the trees also, they want to enjoy they want to play with Krishna. They would like to play with Krishna themselves. And so the sap which is flowing is tears, not tears of joy, not tears of ecstasy, but tears of lamentation, that they're thinking themselves unfortunate that they cannot play with Krishna. And the river was described, that the lotus flowers which are blooming in her waters, they're compared to the the standing of hairs on the body of a devotee. When a devotee takes pleasure in chanting the holy name or in hearing the glories of the Lord, then the hairs will stand on end. It's a symptom of bhava. So the same way the rivers are described as exhibiting bhava with the lotus flowers standing erect in the waters of the river. This will be Kalindi, the river Kalindi, or Manasi Ganga, different waters are there in Vrindavan. All right, so those were just some points from the ninth verse. And we're going to go on but after he, talking about the flute and, the, and the, the rivers and trees, we're going to hear about the the glory of the earth planet itself.
That's text number 10. Would someone like to read for us the verse? Who was going to read this verse yesterday? Someone? Can I read? Yes, please. Yes, go ahead, read the translation. O friend, Vrindavana is spreading the glory of the heart, the glory of the heart, having obtained the treasure of the lotus feet of Krishna, the son of devotee. The peacock dance madly when they hear Govinda's flute, and when other creatures see them from the hilltops, they all become stunned. Uh -huh. So, Vrindavan is spreading the glory of the earth. In the universe, there are so many planets. The earth is one tiny planet within this huge universe with so many planets. And on this one planet earth, there are so many different countries and in each country, there are so many different cities and towns and villages. But in India, there's this one very special village, which is called Vrindavan. And this city, this land of Vrindavan is very, very special, because just simply by the presence of Vrindavan, the forests of Vrindavan, it brings glory to the earth planet. So this is, this is a, the, the earth, we may usually, you know, people think just like people think, materialistic minded people, they think, oh, I should go to the West. You know, the West is more opulent, the West is more enjoyable. If you go to America, go and work there in America, you can really enjoy life there, you really get a good time there. If you go to the West and go to America, and then have the, a good life and opulence. Or some people think about maybe we should go to heaven. And there are people who do uh, Agnihotris and their idea is at the end of life they'll be elevated to Swargaloka. They'll go up to the heavenly planets and they will enjoy there. And that's their motivation in life. That they're simply planning that for the next life we'll take birth in the heavenly planets and enjoy there in Swargaloka. Because in Swargaloka everyone has a nice body and there's no disease and there's no old age and the, the, there's so many good things. All the women are very beautiful and the men are very handsome and everyone's very intelligent and they have airplanes to fly from planet to planet. So like this, people are attracted, they want to go to Swarg. But those people who are actually intelligent, they understand that it's not Swargalok you want to go to. But the place where we really want to go to is Vrindavan. And it's Vrindavan which is glorified by even the residents of heaven. The people in heavenly planets, they all would like to take a birth in Vrindavan. Then we see the goddess of fortune herself, Lakshmi, that she comes to Vrindavan and she desires to, she comes to Vrindavan to do her austerities and pray to Krishna that she can take part in his pastimes. And it's that Vrindavan became glorious because of the presence of Mother Lakshmi. So she's here. So that's one point about Vrindavan. And it's mentioned here also, it said, the lotus feet of Krishna, the son of Devaki. So that also should be noted that when, when they say the son of Devaki, this is actually Mother Yashoda. The Mother Yashoda has two names. One name is Yashoda and the other name is Devaki. So because she has the same name as Vasudev's wife, that's why 
they could become such good friends. So it says Devaki Nandan, but actually it's Yashoda Nandan in reality. And just simply uh, using the other name. So that should be noted. And then we want to understand the glory of Vrindavan. But the glory of Vrindavan is there that, that so many cows. Of course, there was that discussion in the Chaitanya Charitamrita at the time of Rathyatra. It was uh, Swarup Damodar, Lord Chaitanya's secretary, was talking with Srivas Pandit. And Srivas Pandit, being an expansion of Narada Muni, he was praising the glories of the goddess of fortune. Oh, look at the opulence and everything. And Srivas uh, Swarup Damodar said to him, Oh, Srivas, don't you know the, the opulence of Vrindavan? And uh, Swarup Damodar went on to describe the opulence of Vrindavan, how all the cows are Kamadenu cows and the trees are Kalpa Briksha and the dust is all Chintamani. And so that is real opulence. The real opulence is there in Vrindavan. The people of Vrindavan, however, are so pure-hearted, they're such pure souls, they never desire any material sense gratification. Just yesterday we celebrated the disappearance day of His Divine Grace, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, and someone sent me a, a very interesting statement which he made in a lecture. He was talking about the meaning of a brajbasi. He said, brajbasi means those who walk. And when they walk, they walk for the pleasure of Krishna. They chant the holy name and they worship Krishna. They don't just engage in ordinary mundane sense gratification. Those who are actually brajbasis, they simply walk for Krishna. And Swar uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati then went on to say, he said, My Guru Maharaj, he was a bridge basi. Srimati Radharani, she was a bridge basi. And so Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, they were bridge basis. Sudama and Subhao, Srinam, they were bridge basis. Not everybody's a bridge basi. It's not just you take birth in Vrindavan and makes you a bridge basi. You have to live like a Brajbasi. You have to chant the names of Krishna and you have to absorb the mind in remembering Krishna. So here we're hearing about the glories of Vrindavan and how when Krishna plays on the flute, then the peacocks dance madly. When they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they feel so much ecstasy. So, uh, in uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's purport on this section, he talks about how Lord Krishna will be approached by the peacocks and the peacocks will ask him, they will, they will say to Krishna, make us dance. And so Krishna will get in the center and he'll be surrounded by a circle of peacocks and Krishna will play the flute and he will dance at the same time. And in this way, all the peacocks, they also dance and they're also satisfied when they hear Krishna playing on the flute. They're very happy and they're so satisfied that they, they you know, just like when some artist is performing, maybe some musical performance, then the audience, will, they'll give some presentation, maybe a bouquet of flowers or something. So they came, uh, the peacocks would give up their feathers, their tail feathers, and then Krishna will take the, the tail feathers of the peacocks and he'll put one of them at least in his turban and wear it on his head for decoration. And in this way everybody's pleased. So when Krishna would dance and play on his flute, all the different creatures in the jungle, in the forest, they would all come and they'd all watch. The, the, the deer, the does and the bucks, and then also the pigeons and the, the doves. And 
uh, there will be other, what, what, of course the cows and the calves, they're all there and they're all relishing, they're all very happy to hear the sound of Krishna's flute. Hearing the sound of Krishna's flute awakens their ecstatic love for Krishna. So the purport says, Sridhar Swami explains that because activities such as those described in this verse do not occur in any other world, the earth is unique. In fact, the earth glories are being spread by wonderful Vrindavan because it is the place of Krishna's pastimes. So the wonderful thing about Vrindavan is Krishna performs all of his pastimes there, particularly Rasa dances there, and Vrindavan is also goes everywhere, Krishna's lotus feet, his footprints are there, all around Vrindavan. That, that is different, we, we don't get that in Vaikuntha, remember? Do you remember? Why not? Why are there no footprints of Krishna in Vaikuntha? Because he has Krishna wears. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he wears slippers, right? He's wearing slippers in Vaikuntha. <laughs> Prabhupada always liked to wear slippers, actually. Tamal Krishna Goswami told me, said Prabhupada never usually went barefooted. He would always uh, have some slipper on his feet. Okay, so we hear, we're hearing about the Earth planet and how it's affecting everyone. Alright, so, oh, there's more over in the page here. Alright, we, two names, yeah, we covered that. And then Krishna singing and dancing. Okay. Alright, so we covered it all. We'll go on text number 11. Someone like to read for us? Yes, Mary. Yes, please, Mary very good, yes. Saha Krishna Sara, accompanied by the black deer, their husbands, right? So we're going to hear about the, the deer, the bucks and the does, the does being the, the wives of the bucks. So translation, Blessed are all these foolish deer because they have approached Maharaj Nanda's son who is gorgeously dressed and is playing on his flute. Indeed, both the doe and the bucks worship the Lord with looks of love and affection. Yes, would you read the purport for us? Yes, ma'am. This translation is quoted from Srila Prabhupada's Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Leela 17.36 According to the Acharyas, the gopis were thinking as follows. The female deer can approach Krishna along with their husbands because Krishna is the ultimate object of affection for the male deer. Because of their affection for Krishna, they are encouraged by seeing their wives attracted to him and thus consider their household lives fortunate. Indeed, they become joyful upon seeing how their wives are searching after Krishna and following along, they urge their wives to go to the Lord. On the other hand, our husbands are jealous of Krishna and because of their lack of devotion to him, they cannot even stand to smell his fragrance. Therefore, what is the use of our lives? Thank you. Thank you, Manaji. Yes. All right. So we're hearing how these different animals in the forests of Vrindavan, how they are all attracted and how they have different kinds of uh, loving relationships with Krishna. 
and the gopis at least are observing this they're seeing they're seeing the devotion in these other creatures so this is actually this is the, the, another wonderful point about the devotion of the gopis that they don't minimize other people but they're appreciating the devotion service done by others we should always appreciate the, the service which other devotees do and we should never want to criticize them and minimize it we, we want to always praise it right Prabhupada talked about the <laughs> the envious man and one man was telling the other man he said my son's become a high court judge and the other man was envious or jealous he said oh he may be a high court judge but he cannot get the salary of a high court judge and so like that you know minimizing someone's position but the gopis they don't do that they they glorify these others and even though they're dumb animals they're dumb animals but the gopis are appreciating their devotion and the gopis are thinking we're more intelligent but our life becomes useless because we can't get to meet krishna but these animals and they don't have much of a brain but they're so fortunate they're able to go to meet krishna they're they're successful their lives are successful so this is the, this is a good fortune that the, these even in the animal body in the body of a deer living in the jungle they could go and they could see krishna they could hear the sound of the flute and with the sound of the flute then it awakened their ecstatic feeling towards krishna and the the does would the the female deer they would all come towards Krishna at least they would look towards Krishna but the gopis they hardly ever got to see Krishna they could hear the flute but when they come to see it he was always far away they couldn't see him difficult for them to get a chance to see him but just to get the glance of Krishna then their life is successful if Krishna just throws his glance, as we heard yesterday, that if, if Krishna looks at the gopis even once, then he will throw the glance at them and they will be stricken and they will give up their shyness, they will give up their bashfulness and they will be eager, they will be very, very eager to come closer and to be with Krishna. So the, these... Uh, black deer they're called krishna sara right those who take krishna along as an object of worship krishna the, their husbands the wives of the deer they're called the krishna sara so they also worship him so this is really agitating to the gopis when they see that not only are the wives worshipping Krishna but their husbands also are attracted and so seeing the wives so attracted to Krishna the husbands become when or when the wives see their husbands no when the husbands see their wives attracted to Krishna they're happy they don't mind they, they think this is the success of married life. This is how Grihastha should think. That the success of married life is when one, one of the members of the family becomes attached to Krishna and develops their love for Krishna. Then it should inspire the other members to follow. So it's a very important point to see the the wives becoming attached to krishna and the husbands appreciating the fact that their wives are such nice devotees of krishna and they're thinking our our married life is now successful 
So they also go to meet Krishna. But the gopis, they say, we are so unfortunate. Because if, if there's even a trace of anything connected with Krishna, then our husbands can become violent. <laughs> or if there's any, if, they, if my husband even smells his fragrance, then he gets so angry, he'll become violent. No, the gopis are lamenting their condition. That even though we, we, we are attracted to Krishna, our husbands are so much against. Now this is a common phenomenon, of course. In our preaching, all around the world, we do find, you know, we get a lot of pious ladies, and we don't find it so easy to get the men to have the same kind of piety. Maybe some of the ladies could tell us some secrets. What, what would you suggest? What's a good strategy in order to uh, cultivate the husband, in order to help the husband to become a better devotee. Any suggestions? Or to bring the husband in to Krishna consciousness? If you want to bring... Maharaj, it is, Maharaj, it is said that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Feed him nice prasadam. Feed him nice prasadam. Is that going to help him accept Krishna? I don't want my wife associating with another man or running after another man. I want my wife to be chased. She should, you know, she should be with me. Why she go, has to go and see this other man? Why is she so attached to this other man? So, what can we do about it? What's the, what's the solution? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, 9.22 Krishna says that Ananyas Chintayan Tomam Jejana Paripasate Tesam Nitya Vyukta Nam Yoga Kshema Vahamyam. This Ananya, without other, without any deviation, only me you have to think. This is Krishna. Krishna wants actually like this. Only me you have to think. This, this nature of the men came from Krishna. But how is that going to help my husband, you know? My husband doesn't want me to go to be with Krishna. You want to break up my marriage? I should just end my marriage? When, just... she... <laughs> when, when she becomes good devotee, automatically she will become. Yeah, or else, like, she, she has to glorify the husband. Like when she is doing Krishna Consciousness, uh, once in a while she can request a nice time, she can request them to chant one round. Then she has to, she can say that, that you know, I was chanting, it was not so good, but when I was talk, chanting with you, it was very, very good. So why don't you help me to chant daily one, two rounds with me? No Krishna Conscious philosophy, but he can chant. Mm, the husband say, I have to work. I don't have time to sit and chant. Why well, I will chant another man's name? No. You should chant my name. I'm your husband. You should chant my name. Okay, I'll think that you are Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good so, Krishna is all attractive. For me, you are all, all attractive. Hmm. Okay, yes. Very nice. Nice argument. Um, yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I don't particularly have any solution, but in due course of my preaching, we have come across this kind of situations. And sometimes the situation becomes very serious also. I can only, I, I can only share the experience, but like uh, what, what I've seen uh, happening. Um, in, in some cases, uh, the uh, generally we, we see in most cases, of course, in most cases, you see uh, uh, in, uh, in the cap, uh, case of a husband and wife, wife generally gets uh, attracted quickly to Krishna in comparison to the husband. Generally, I mean, yes, yes, I, agreed, there. agreed, yeah. Uh, 
but then there is there is some other things like go a little deeper that attraction for krishna you see uh, in in some cases i have seen it's more on the sentimental platform marath than actually based on any sound uh, philosophical basis so uh, you know, i have we have seen at least in india i can talk about in delhi places like that i see this this attraction towards krishna is takes on a very sentimental form like uh, they see krishna as the the guy next door actually they may not they may not confess that because of the peer pressure in his con the the kind of is environment is con provides us a very like vaidhi kind of uh, environment but uh, they have this idea of that the, the the guy next door kind of thing is krishna then we can talk to krishna we can cry for krishna most things are like that thing comes very easy to uh, women generally i've seen and that is very hard to come by for the for the male yes right and to to complicate the matters further in many cases the uh, the wives they might not be working working ladies and non working ladies that there is also a difference work jab, pe- people when they are not working so they have got enough time to uh, come and serve in the temple and that what that's exactly what the temple is looking for somebody who can share their responsibilities so the temple gives them services and certainly then they get more appraises praises from the temple and the the husband thinks that the husband the poor husband comes after 10 hours of work and when he comes he is half asleep during the classes when he comes to the temple so nobody appreciates him everybody appreciates his wife how nicely she is serving how nicely she is uh, like you know uh, in improving and getting more seek quote and unquote serious in krishna consciousness so all of these things actually have the uh, the opposite effect and that like becomes a very big trouble uh, as far as the marriage is concerned sometimes that the husband do not appreciate then after a point of time the, the wife spends more time with the devotees or goes to the temple or those temple services and things like that but in the hearts of heart the problem actually is that that she he is feeling insecure so i i don't know exactly how to i mean except for the from the from the point of view of the temple and the devotees they should take care more of the husband i think at this point of time so that he doesn't feel insecure but uh, i think i mean uh, yeah hari leela prabhu is here he has got lots of experience he can share he must have come across that kind of cases yeah thank Am you i right hari leela prabhu i don't know but like if like i have the same experience as you have <laughs> yeah i mean it's true that uh, sometimes the problems develop between husband and wife uh, but um, generally we have seen that uh, uh, the story is not black and white sometimes yes. there are shades of gray in the story uh, so we have to and there is no like a quick fix solution or one size fits all kind of solution for this kind of things as far as i know that we have to actually see each and every individual case we have to see where the husband feel left out uh, feels left out we have to see that where the wife maybe she is overdoing something or maybe there is a genuine problem uh, in this kind of things so we have to analyze case by case and then we have to see that what could be the best remedy for a given solution generally uh, there is also a tendency amongst uh, uh, devotees especially grahastha devotees that uh, uh sometimes they fail to recognize that there are vaishnavas at home also i'm not saying always but sometimes they fail to recognize that there are vaishnavas at home also somehow uh devotees have this idea that vaishnava seva should be done exclusively outside the house and the inside house uh, whatever is done is some sort of maya some kind of idea is there or uh, the devotees are very tolerant when they preach to outsiders people outside the house but when they come and deal with people inside the house they become very intolerant uh, either they may be husband or wife they become quite intolerant uh, they become irritated they shout they did so many things uh, so 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 that's why each and every case has to be seen uh, the idea is that if husband and wife can progress together in krishna consciousness that's the best thing if that can happen that's the best and the easiest method then they will have a very good journey 
they will have least misunderstanding and they can progress nicely. But if one partner is lagging behind or one partner is not at voting, uh, then a lot of care and a lot of uh, guidance and counseling is required so that somehow we can try to bring the other partner also into the ocean. And that's what I would say. Yes, thank you very much, Prabhu. This is very, very helpful. Very many nice points there. I really appreciated your comments. Very good. I agree with you that it's not hard and fast one way. There, there are many different situations and we have to be a little intelligent to look and to understand how to deal with the problems. We do. We do want to encourage the family life. We don't want to break up the home, but at the same time we also want to help them to progress in their Krishna consciousness. So uh, tolerance, of course, is very much required, a lot of tolerance and intelligence and dealing. Some, but often, sometimes, you know, the woman comes and there's a past, you know, before they come to Krishna consciousness, there's a past where there's been a lot of problems between the husband and wife, a lot of friction. And then she comes to Krishna consciousness and she brings the past with her into Krishna consciousness, which doesn't make it any easier. Okay, so. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. On the lighter note, actually, you asked the question to all the Matajis to actually address this problem. <laughs> I was wondering that Brahmacharis got into it, Grahasthas <laughs> got into it. It appears to me that they are defending their own positions instead of actually hearing what Mathas have to say. That was on a lighter note. Hare Krishna. All right. Please, I didn't try to defend my position. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very good. Yeah, I agree. We should we should hear from the marriages. Please, marriages. May I say something, Maharaj? Oh, please do. Yes. Um, I heard in one lecture that none of the family members should feel that Krishna is their competition. So whatever the ladies do, it should never come in the way of their service to their family members. So yeah, you chant, you you do worshiping of deities, uh, you you go on book distribution, whatever else is your service, do it in a way that it is not obstructing your husband or children's need of you. you know? Your child is there uh, before you came to Krishna conscious. Maybe every day evening you sit and study uh, or help them with homework. Now, if you say, I'm going to read Bhagavatam, then the child thinks Krishna is my competition. My mother is taking Krishna away from me. No? So they develop a, a negative, uh, negative feeling towards Krishna. So everything we have to do in such a way that whatever we offer to them is never obstructed. In, in fact, they should feel that from the time the wife has come to Krishna consciousness or mother has come to Krishna consciousness. She is giving us so much more. And, and that is because of Krishna. You know, Krishna has made her a better person. So it is good for me to also accept Krishna. You know? So we, we need to be very conscious that nothing we do to them becomes less because we have to do something for Krishna. In fact, it should become more so that they like it. More. Yes, very, very good point. Thank you. That uh, was a very nice point. I need to remember that myself. <laughs> it's very important because people often, I often have to advise people on this, you know, ladies, so many ladies come and they have that situation. You know, they're very devoted, but the husband's not interested and the husband's against it. And, what to do, how to handle it. So yes, they they have to give proper attention and take care for the husband and please him. And children also as well, they should not feel neglected. They should feel encouraged. Okay, so let's go ahead then, text number 12. Someone can read? Maharaj, if I may. Please. 
कृष्ण निरीक्ष वनोत्सव रूपशीलम श्रुवा च तत्पनीत वेणु विवेक्त गीत दिमगत स्मरण Krishna's beauty and character create a festival for all women. Indeed, when the demigods wives flying in airplanes with their husbands catch sight of him and hear his resonant flute song, their hearts are shaken by Cupid and they become so bewildered that the flowers fall out of their hair and their bells lose. Mm. Yes. Uh, would you like to read the purport? Yes, Maharaj. In Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri La Prabhupada comments. This verse indicates that the transcendental sound of the flute of Krishna extended to all corners of the universe. Also, it is significant that the gopis knew about the different kinds of airplanes flying in the sky. In fact, while sitting on the laps of their demigod husbands, the demigodesses became agitated by hearing the sounds of Krishna's flute. Thus, the gopis thought they themselves should not be blamed for their ecstatic conjugal attraction for Krishna, who, after all, was a cowherd boy from their own village, and thus a natural object of their love. If even the demigodesses became mad after Krishna, how could poor earthly cowherd girls from Krishna's own village avoid having their hearts completely conquered by his loving glances and the sounds of his flute? The gopis also considered. that the demigods although noting their wives attraction to krishna did not become envious the demigods are actually very refined in culture and intelligence and therefore when flying in their airplanes they regularly take their wives along to see krishna the gopis thought our husbands on the other hand are envious therefore even the inferior deer are better off than we and the demigodesses are also very fortunate whereas we poor human beings in an intermediate position are most unfortunate <laughs> thank you prabhu yes so this is a very wonderful uh, verse here in purport and shrila prabhupad about well, the commentation the purport prabhupad's disciples are explaining oh well no it's from prabhupad's book from krishna the personality of god so shrila prabhupad himself is explaining that <clears throat> the, the demigods they don't mind their wives being attracted to krishna in fact the demigods themselves bring their wives to see krishna as we heard in the previous verse uh, we were talking about the the doves and the bucks the bucks were happy to see their wives advance in krishna consciousness so similarly here also the demigods are also happy to see their wives attracted to krishna but we also notice that the demigodesses were sitting on the lap of their husband and when they heard the sound of krishna's flute they became attracted their lusty desires were aroused towards krishna although they're sitting on the lap of their husbands so that is really really surprising it's really a very unique situation that the women are in that situation and, and, and amorous relationship with their husbands and when they hear the sound of krishna's flute they immediately become attracted to krishna and their husbands are not envious their husbands don't mind and their husbands even bring them to see krishna and the gopis they're lamenting because they're thinking well the the doe the deer they're dumb they're dumb they're uh, dumb they're not very quick witted they're dull witted and the demigods and their wives they're very quick witted they're very sharp witted and they're both attracted to krishna but we're not we we're, we're not able to show our devotion to we're not able to show our interest to krishna because of our husbands that if our husbands see us being attracted to krishna they will get violent with us <laughs> so we can realize the gopis are a little bit attached to their home still 
They're not ready to give up their home and they're not ready to leave their husbands. They still have some kind of uh, attachment there. So this is their uh, bad luck. This is their unfortunate condition that they still have that desire to enjoy the material world or to enjoy their family relationship, even though they're such great devotees of Krishna. So can we say it's like that? Is it the fact that the devotees, the gopis are really attached to their home? No, Maharaj, they are not attached, but they are thinking that they are uh, more unfortunate than the others. Yes, so, but couldn't they do something about it? Couldn't they just go to Krishna and be with Krishna? We see like, uh, you know, the, the story of the, um, the Dvijapatnis, the Dvijapatnis, wives of the Brahmins during the ritual, the Dvijapatnis, they went to Krishna and they didn't care. They said, well, no, it doesn't matter. We won't go back to our husbands. We'll just stay with you, Krishna. But Krishna told them, no, you should go back, right? You know the story, Dvijapatnis. They went to Krishna. They had that prema. Does it mean the gopis here? Maybe they don't have that kind of prema. Is it there on a lesser platform? Any? My, yes, my understanding is, uh, Maharaj, that they will go to Krishna at an appropriate time. Right now, the time is not appropriate. Uh, it is daytime, and uh, if they approach Krishna at this time, then it would cause a lot of disturbance in the village, and people may. Uh, speak so many things about Krishna himself. So they are just waiting for their uh, appropriate time. And in the process of uh, uh, feeling this separation from Krishna, uh, they are already with Krishna because uh, feeling that separation, uh, it enhances their mood to go and see him. So it enriches their mood to go and see him. Yes, so that I, I, separation I, I, itself is... Uh, is like being with Krishna for them. Yes, Prabhu, I agree with you. I think that's a, the main point there, that we have to understand that how absorbed they are in thinking of Krishna, that although they're not able to actually go there to be with Krishna, but still they're remembering Krishna and they're really constant, they really think about Krishna and they appreciate the good fortune of all those others who are with Krishna. So it's not just being close to Krishna. And in fact, Prabhupada taught, talked about how, you know, different people were around, Bhakti Siddhanta, Sarasati Prabhupada, but he said uh, they didn't follow the instructions. They were around, but they didn't follow the instructions. And just like insects may be very close to the body, but they simply bite. And so you don't want to be like that. You don't want to just give trouble to Krishna or to the spiritual master. But the important thing is to remember them, to be conscious of them and to follow their instructions. So certainly, the, as, you, as Hari Lila Prabhu said, the gopis were very Krishna conscious. They were, they were really thinking of Krishna and meditating on Krishna. And that is the perfection of their life. It's not just going to be near to Krishna or to see Krishna dance or to look at how he's dressed, but it's to remember Krishna constantly at every moment. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Text number 13. Whose turn is it to read? Shall I try, Guru Maharaj? Please do, yes. Kavascha Krishna Mukha Nirgata Venu Gita Piyusha Muta Bita Karna Putai Pipantya Shavasnutas Tanapaya Kavala Smatas Tur Govindamatmani Drishashukala Sprishantya 
Yes, very good, yes. Translation. Using their upraised ears as vessels, the cows are drinking the nectar of the flute song flowing out of Krishna's mouth. The calves, their mouths full of milk from their mother's moist nipples, stand still as they take Govinda within themselves through their ear, through their tear-filled eyes and embrace him within their hearts. Okay, thank you. Yes. So now we're hearing about the cows. We heard about the deers and, the, and uh, we heard about, well, we heard about the flute and the river and the trees and then we heard about the, 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 the deer and, and then we heard about the demigoddesses and the demigods flying in their airplanes and how they were affected hearing the sound of the flute. And now we're hearing about the cows and the calves. And it's described that the cows, that they may be, when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, their ears raise up, their ears stand up on end. So it's, it's like a vessel or like a cup. It's like a container. They want to, everything to be caught in the cup. So the same way the cows, when they hear Krishna playing on the flute, their ears stand up on end and they're able to catch every vibration, every note which comes from Krishna's flute. And at the same time, their calves are drinking their milk, but the calves are also affected. And the calves, they may be in the middle of drinking the milk from their mother's udder, but, and their mouth is full of milk. And when they hear Krishna play on the flute, their mouths will just open and the milk will fall out of their mouth. They, they will just, they won't be able to swallow the milk even because they're so stunned, they're so filled with emotion when they hear Krishna's flute being played. So we were talking about the cows yesterday, actually. Remember, a devotee was at talking, at, there was, we were discussing something about the rasa of the cows, and I was questioning it. It seems like I'm wrong because I was reading the purport here by Vishwanath Chakravarti, although there's no purport on the, uh, in the Bhagavatam, but Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he did write something on that. Uh, do, you, do you want to see it? I'll just show you. I'll try to show you. I don't know <laughs> if I can. Okay, are you able to see it? Prabhu's? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, oh, okay, good. Let's see. We're, text number, what text is it again? 13. 13, yeah, we're on text 13. All right, so we were talking about the, the rasa, and we'll just read what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says. Is it, one cannot say that the bewilderment from the flute is generated only from conjugal desire of the female only. So we may consider like the, the conjugal love, you know, because these are females, as you said, it's easier for these ladies to have this feeling of conjugal love for Krishna towards a man. They'll have that feeling. It's much easier for them to feel conjugal love for the man. Another man feeling conjugal love for another man, that's weird. But the gopis, they, they are women, they can feel conjugal love for Krishna. But it's pointed out here that this desire for conjugal love is not for females only. And see the example of the cows and their calves. In feeding of spilling the nectar, the cows have raised their ears like cups to hear the flute. The cause of bewilderment is not just Vatsalya Bhav towards Krishna, for their calves also without Vatsalya Bhav 
were bewildered. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he says that the cows, obviously, they will have that mood, they will think of Krishna in a motherly way, which is Vatsalya Bhav, Vatsalya Ras. And the cows, when Krishna calls them, they come running. They're very happy. They're, 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 these cows, Krishna's cows, are all great devotees. They're very, very great devotees. They're not ordinary souls. And they're in that body of cows simply for the pleasure of Krishna. And when Krishna calls the cows, they will come running. And they have great affection for Krishna, licking Krishna. And they're always very, very close. They like to be with Krishna. And Krishna likes to be with them. So it's a kind of motherly affection. When we think of cows, we think of generally, we would think like a mother because she gives milk. Cow is one of the mothers, right? It's, it's seven mothers, and cow is one of them. And so the, the cow had a natural kind of vatsalya ras there towards Krishna. But here, Acharya says, well, what about the calves? Because the calves, they also have that same kind of bewilderment hearing the sound of Krishna's flute. Now the calves, they're not going to be thinking of Krishna like in a motherly way. The calves, they're just small and they won't be, they, they'll just be, they'll have a different kind of rasa with Krishna. I don't know exactly. But we hear they're also bewildered. They're also experiencing some kind of bhava. So the Acharya goes on, the calves who had just began to drink their mother's milk, on hearing the flute, perked up their ears to drink that sound also. Not able to drink the other milk, the milk fell from their open mouth and they stood as if stunned. The cows brought Govinda close with their glances and through their eyes they had him enter their hearts. Touching him in their minds, their minds placed him on their laps out of Vatsalya Bhav. Then they become stunned. Out of bliss, tears fell from their eyes. In this way, all living entities have love of Krishna. They are all fortunate to meet Krishna, but we are unfortunate being separated from him. So the Acharya describes here to us how the cows meditated on Krishna. They heard the sound of the flute and the cows, they brought Krishna closer through their eyes and they had him enter their hearts. And then placing him on their laps out of Vatsalya Bhav. So it indicates that you know, there is certainly, the natural rasa for the cows would be Vatsalya Bhav, but here it indicates something more than Vatsalya Bhav, because even the calves are also experiencing this bewilderment. So it may be that the Acharya is pointing out that they're all in Madhurya Bhav. Now some people do say that, they do say that in Goloka Vrindavan, all, that all the devotees there are in Madhurya Bhav. They're all in Madhurya Prem. Not so easy to understand. Mother Yashoda also in Madhurya Prem? I don't know. <laughs> but something, because he's arguing, if, if, if the calves are feeling this bewilderment, they're also attracted to the sound of Krishna's flute. What to speak of the cows? So this is the wonder of this pastime. Right? Okay, so that's text 13. We'll go ahead, text number 14, and we're going to hear about the trees and the birds, the different birds which are there in the forest of Vrindavan. Certainly there'll be many birds in Vrindavan forest. All right, who would like to read text number 14? 
You've read before, you can read again, please. Uh, I'll read. Prayo Batampa Bihaka Munaya Vanesmin Krishna Hishi Tam Taduti Tam Kala Veno Gitam Maru Yaye Druma Pujan Luchira Prabalan Shrin Vanti Melita Trishovi Gatanya Vajaha. Yes, very um, good. Yes. Our mother, in this forest, all the birds have risen onto the beautiful branches of the trees to see Krishna. With closed eyes, they are simply listening in silence to the sweet vibrations of his flute, and they are not attracted by any sound. Surely these birds are on the same level as great sages. Mm, right. Surely these birds are on the same level as great sages. Oh. Just understand who are these birds in the forests of Vrindavan. All these different living entities in Vrindavan, they're all very, very special. So the trees, the birds, the, even the hogs, right? Prabhupada spoke about the pigs, the hogs in Vrindavan. He said that they were some yogis who had committed some offense and they had to take birth in the body of a hog. But that would be their last birth before they go back to Godhead. And so all these Damvasis, they're all very, very special. And these birds, they're, they're like great sages. Why? Why are they like great sages? Well, we see with closed eyes, they're simply listening in silence to the sweet vibration of Krishna's flute. And they're not attracted by any other sound. Now previously, great sages would be, met, they'd be discussing the Brahman. But these great sages, now they've come to Vrindavan and they're so fortunate that they're able to hear about Krishna so that they simply close their eyes and they sit silently, motionless. Just like yogis meditating, great sages, they live in the forest, you'll see with their eyes closed, silent, motionless. Prabhupada's purport says Sig significantly, it is stated here, that even great sages become maddened by the sound of Krishna's flute, which is a completely spiritual vibration. The word Ruchira Pravalan indicates that even the branches of the trees are transformed in ecstasy when struck by the vibration of Krishna's flute song. Indra, Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu being primordial gods travel throughout the universe and have extensive knowledge of the science of music. And yet even these great personalities have never heard or composed music like that which emanates from Krishna's flute. Indeed the birds are so moved by the blissful sound that in their ecstasy they close their eyes and cling to the branches to avoid falling off the trees. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains that the gopis would sometimes address each other as Amba or Mother. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so the, we heard about the calves previously. The calves, they're material, right? So the, they're, ta they're still, they're still you know, and tasting some kind of material pleasure. But now we're hearing about the birds. What about the birds? Well, they're, they're like great sages. They're compared to Atmaramas, meaning those who are completely detached from the material world, no material desires, fixed in knowledge, and they cannot be disturbed. Or can they be disturbed? 
Can they be disturbed? Well, Krishna attracts them also with his sweetness. When Krishna plays on the flute, then they are also attracted. They are also influenced. They're, they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, it enters their ears, goes into their heart. And they sit there on the tree and they listen to the sound of the flute. And the trees, they're also influenced by the sound of the flute. The branches, when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, then the, the, some of the branches, they begin to grow new leaves and they, and they break, begin to grow buds. So this is the effect of hearing the, the flute sound. You could say also from the touch of these great sages in the form of birds, that the touch of their feet on the tree is allowing the tree to gain new life and to grow new branches and buds and leaves. So we can understand from this verse how much all living entities take pleasure in the sound of Krishna's flute. It doesn't matter, great demigods, they may be very old, or they may be traveling all over the universe. I don't want to speak of little devotees traveling around the countryside preaching. Great sages like Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva and Vishnu, they also travel around. And, and they've been traveling for a long time and they know a lot, but they cannot play the flute like Krishna. And when they hear Lord Krishna play the flute, then they are also attracted, right? That's one quality of the four qualities which are unique to Krishna. One is Krishna's flute playing. So even Lord Vishnu, although Lord Vishnu is such an exalted demigod, of course he's not a demigod, he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead also, but he cannot equal Lord Krishna. And he cannot play the flute like Krishna. I was telling you about Gop Kumar coming there to Vaikuntha and he was meeting uh, Lord Krishna there in, in Dwarka and, and he, he saw Gop Kumar with the flute and he was he was thinking about Vrindavan. He had Gop Kumar play the flute for him. And when he heard Gop Kumar play the flute, then he was so attracted, he was so pleased. So Lord Vishnu also takes pleasure in hearing the flute. And taking pleasure, naturally you, want, you enjoy something, you become absorbed in relishing something, you close your eyes and we will relish it like we never heard it before. And we don't talk, we, we just absorb ourselves in hearing that sound. Although great sages, often they would speak a lot, they would discuss the Brahman, and they would discuss about what is the absolute truth. But when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, then that's the end of it. Just hear the sound of Krishna's flute. Nothing to say, no need to say anything anymore when you hear the sound of Krishna's flute. All right, we'll take a break. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. We can begin. All right. Oh, we were talk, speaking about the, the birds. I was just thinking, you know, <laughs> the birds, it, it, it's, it, it's a, a problem sometimes. We, we don't always appreciate who are these great souls in these different bodies. Just like I'm living here in Mayapur just now, and there's so many birds. <laughs> but I don't always, I, I can't always think of them that they're great sages. But... Actually, we should think like that, that these, these birds, these different creatures who've taken their birth in the holy dham, that they may be great sages, great souls, and they're taking birth for, this, for their 
continued enlightenment. We don't know actually who they are. But we should respect all the residents of the Dham. The trees as well should never take, harm a tree, should never break the branches of the trees and Dham. Rather we, we embrace them and we, uh, we, we want to get the mercy from these creatures. That they're very special, very fortunate. So that was just something I was thinking about. Okay, we're on text number 15 and we're going to hear, in text number 15, we're going to hear about the rivers, uh, the waters which flow in the dam. Who could read it for us? Can I make a comment before that, Maharaj? Yeah. If it's yes, Prabhu, please, yes. As this was this regarding the last verse, <clears throat> the birds and the sages. Uh, I have heard an explanation that why birds are compared to the sages is like those birds they used to climb on the different branches just to see Krishna. Similarly, the sages they go on to the different branches of the Vedic tree, different Upanishads, etc., to know Krishna. And we as Vaishnavas. Our branch is Srimad Bhagavatam from where we can clearly see Krishna. Ah, yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice comment. Oh, yes, that's a very good comment. Thank you so much. And uh, Maharaj, one more regarding the rasas which you were discussing. I'm sorry that time my video was off. I couldn't give comment, Maharaj. Can I make it now? Please. Maharaj, for the rasas, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He has explained that in Vaikuntha there are two and a half rasas and in uh, Goloka five rasas. Oh, so, really? Uh, when he says two and a half rasas, he means that uh, Shanta rasa in completeness and Dasya rasa in completeness and all other rasas are taken as half. So that is uh, because they are not in completeness in uh, Vaikuntha. But when he speaks about uh, Goloka, he says the five rasas are in completeness, but all the rasas are because there is dominance of Madhurya, so all the rasas are touched by Madhurya. Okay. Yes, that sounds nice. All the all the rasas are touched by Madhurya. Mm -hmm. Yes, that I've heard like that before. That Madhurya rasa is very prominent there in Goloka. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Prabhu. That's from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, eh? Uh, yes, Maharaj, exact reference right now. I don't have, but I read it in one of the uh, issues of Harmonist, and he has written in some other book, Maharaj. I can find out and let you know it. Right now, I don't have the reference. No, it's okay. I, I'm happy to hear that from you, though. It's very nice. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. All right, who's going to chant text number 15? Maharaj Tani. Yes, Maharaji, please. Nadas tata tadupadharaya mukunda geetam avritta lakshita mano bhava bhanga vega alingas urmi buddha gai murare Grani Grananti Pada Yugalam Kamalo Pahara. Oh, yes, thank you. Very nice. Translation. When the rivers hear the flute song of Krishna, their minds began to desire him, and thus the flow of their current is broken and their waters are agitated, moving around in whirlpools. Then with the arms of their waist, the rivers embrace Murari's lotus feet and holding on to them, present offering of lotus flowers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And read the purport a little, it's not much. Yes, Maharaj. Even such sacred bodies of water as the Yamuna and Manasa Ganga are enchanted by the flute song and thus they are disturbed by conjugal attraction for Krishna. The gopis are implying that 
since many different types of living beings are overwhelmed by conjugal love for Krishna, why should the gopis be criticized for their intense desire to serve Krishna in the conjugal relationship? <laughs> yes. Why should we criticize the gopis? If all the others are also having conjugal love for Krishna, so why condemn the gopis? Everyone's doing it, right? <laughs> the demigod, the the, demi, the wives of the demigods are doing it, and the 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 does and the bucks are doing it, and the cows and the calves are doing it, and so why should we criticize the the gopis? What's wrong? We shouldn't. Uh, it mentions in this verse about Morari. So the gopis, they, they pray like that. They pray that uh, Morari, that they, that, that they pray that the Cupid or Mara, that, that is killing them. So Krishna should come and save them. <laughs> like Krishna killed the demon Mura. And so the gopis also pray that the gopis they're being killed by by the, the the lusty desires in their hearts are killing them so they want krishna to come and, and slay the demon mura and save them so the these rivers the yamuna or kalindi manasiganga and sometimes they will show these whirlpools so these whirlpools, that's like a display of their, of their, their kind of lust, which is there, which is manifest in them. The influence of the lust causes the whirlpool, and it stops at when the when the when the water gets caught in the whirlpool, then it stops flowing towards the ocean. And the ocean is actually like the husband of the rivers. The rivers are, are feminine, they're like the wives, and the ocean is a husband. But when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, then you get the whirlpool, and the, and, and the water doesn't flow to the sea anymore. And, and it's like, the, go, it's like uh, the rivers have lost all their, they've lost all their control and all their shyness, and the water starts to swell. And there will be waves, and those waves are like arms, and those arms will embrace the lotus feet of Krishna, who is also called Marari, who is standing on the shore of the, the river bank. So in, in this way, the, the, the river offers, uh, takes shelter of Lord Krishna. So, Kamala, the word Kamala is used to described as being lotus, but it can also mean water, and it can also mean wealth. So the point is that they are offering their wealth to Krishna. And again, although the rivers are so attracted to Krishna, the ocean doesn't hold any bad feelings towards their love to Krishna. So the gopis are appreciating again, the rivers are more fortunate than we are. Their husbands favorable. We see similar pastimes and with the Ganga, for example, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was here in Mayapur, how the Ganga would swell and touch the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there's a, there's, a, there's a point where the ocean flows up. It said the ocean flows up. When the tide comes in, then the ocean flows up the Ganga, up the path of the Ganga. And it flows all the way up to a certain point there. It said that that point, the, the ocean flows all the way up because he's so eager to see the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He wants to get the dust, he wants to take the dust from the feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So in this way the ocean flowed up the Ganga to be able to, 
touch the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya. We see Lord Krishna enjoying his pastimes with the Ganga and with the Yamuna. These two rivers particularly are very dear to the Lord. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 16. May I read Maharaj? Yes. Only. Okay, okay. Yoga Priti Maja. Dristva tape rajapasun saharama go pai. Sanjarayantam anuve no mudarayantam. Prema pravrudda udita kusuma valimbi. Sakyur Vyadatsva Vakusambuddha Atapataram Translation mm -hmm. In the company of Balarama and the cowherd boys, Lord Krishna is continuously vibrating his flute as he heard all the animals of Praja, even under the full heat of the summer sun. Seeing this, the cloud in the sky has expanded himself out of love. He is rising high and constructing out of his own body with its multitude of flower-like droplets of water, an umbrella for the sake of his friend. Mm. <laughs> Go ahead, read the purport. Srila Prabhupada states in his Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the scratching heat of the autumn sunshine was sometimes intoler intolerable. And therefore, the clouds in the sky appeared in sympathy above Krishna and Balaram and their boyfriends while they engaged in blowing their flutes. The clouds served as a soothing umbrella over their heads just to make friendship with Krishna. Right. So this is Sakiras. <laughs> we were saying, uh, you know, everything in, everything in Vrindavan and... Uh, Goloka Vrindavan is Madhurya Ras, but it's tinged with all the other Rasas also. So here you can see the clouds also. The, this cloud is a particular friend of Krishna. Why are they friends? Of course, they, they, they have the same color, right? Krishna is like the rain cloud and here's the cloud. <laughs> so they have similar color. So that's one reason why they're friends. But there are some other things also. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur talks about them. He said, uh, they both take away the suffering of the living entities by, their, by giving a shower of rasa. <laughs> the shower of ras. So it takes away the suffering of the living entities. The rain cloud was like an umbrella over Krishna, and, but at the same time there were some drops of water to keep Krishna cool from the heat. So there's a shower of rasa which gives relief to the living entities. And then they're both dark colored and they both have the color of lightning, Krishna's dhoti is the color of lightning, gold and yellow, Krishna's dhoti. So somehow this is compared to the cloud. And both give off sweet sounds. So Krishna, the sweet sound. The clouds give happiness to Krishna. The gopis say the clouds can give happiness to Krishna, but we cannot, the gopis say. How unfortunate we are. So the rumbling of the clouds, uh, when, the, when the clouds rumble, that's when the peacock stands. And when Krishna plays the flute, sometimes when the peacocks will hear the, Krishna playing the flute, they will think this is the rumbling of the clouds and they will also dance. So this is the, the sweet sound, the similar sounds.
Krishna's flute and the rumbling of the clouds, very sweet and pleasing to all living entities. So the clouds like a, a, a light umbrella over the friend, over its friend Krishna. And, and the cloud is able to expand his body so that he can cover the area, so that he can give shelter to Krishna from the scorching heat of the sun. And he can cool Krishna, he's able to cool Krishna by droplets of water. So the Acharyas describe how the cloud increases its size due to its prema, because it has this prema, is in, in this prema of love of Krishna, so it's a, it expands itself to cover Krishna and Balaram and all the cowherd boys from the, the scorching heat of the sun. Right? That's number six, 16. Going ahead, 17. Someone can read? I can read? Yes. Puna Pulinda Urika Epada Jaraga Sri Kungome Nadayeta Stana Manditena Tadar Sanas Mararujas Tanerusitena Limpante Ana Nekuche Suja Hustaladin. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Translation The Aboriginal women of the Vindavan area became disturbed by lust when they see the grass marked with reddish kumkum powder, endowed with the color of Krishna's lotus feet, this powder originally decorated the breast of his beloveds. And when the aboriginal women smear it on their faces and breasts, they feel fully satisfied and give up all, anxiety, all their anxiety. Yes. Would you like to read the purple Prabhu? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada explains this verse as follows. The wanton aboriginal girls also became fully satisfied when they smeared their faces and breasts with the dust of Vrindavan, which was reddish from the touch of Krishna's lotus feet. The aboriginal girls had very full breasts and they were also very lusty. But with their lovers felt their breasts, they were not very satisfied. When they came out into the midst of the forest, they saw that while Krishna was walking, some of the leaves and creepers of Vindavan had turned reddish from the kumkum powder which fell from his lotus feet. His lotus feet were held by the gopis on their breasts, which were also smeared with kumkum powder. But when Krishna traveled in the Vindavan forest with Balram, and his boyfriends, the reddish powder fell on the ground. So the lusty aboriginal girls, while looking towards Krishna playing his flute, saw the reddish kumkum on the ground and immediately took it and smeared it over their faces and breasts. In this way, they became fully satisfied, although they were not satisfied with their lovers touched when their lovers touched their breasts. All mentally lusty desires can be immediately satisfied if one comes in contact with Krishna Consciousness. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, so very nice point by Prabhupada here. All material desires can be satisfied immediately when we come in contact with Krishna Consciousness. So this example is very interesting. We're hearing about the, the dust, this uh, kumkum powder, which falls on the ground and where does it come from and what is the nature of this dust? Why is it so powerful? It's so powerful that just simply by these Aborigine women putting it on their own faces and on their own breasts that they give up their lusty desires. So then this, it shows us something of the power of this dust. What is this dust? This kumkum. Where is it coming from, actually? Um, so it's described to us that this is actually coming from one of Krishna's lovers, 
And of course, Krishna's lover is actually Srimati, Sri Radhika or Srimati Radharani. So it was the dust from her lotus feet, the, the, the dust from her lotus feet or from her breasts, wherever it came from, somehow it was on Krishna and then it fell off Krishna and fell on the ground. And these Aborigine ladies, the, the what are they called, the Palingas? Hmm? The Polindas, they, they got the dust and they took it and they put it on their faces and they put it on their breasts and they felt the, the effect of it. And the effect was that they were fully satisfied. But it's pointed out when their husbands or when their lovers touched them, they didn't feel satisfaction. They didn't feel that. So this is the special nature, the dust from the feet of such a great devotee. The, the verse doesn't really speak about Srimati Radharani here because the gopis, they, they want, they, they're very shy, they want to cover up. But it, it, it's, when we think about it, it's, it very clearly indicates that this powder must have originally decorated the form or the body of Srimati Radharani. Because she is the, the one who actually Krishna loves more than anybody. So that reddish kumkum powder was taken up and that's how the Palindas, the Aborigine ladies became free of their lusty desires. Is that clear? Everybody under everybody agree on that? Any points? Hi so, Krishna Guru Maharaj. I have a question about the last sentence of this purport. Uh-huh. Because all material lusty desires can be immediately satisfied. So we see people they contact with Krishna consciousness, they still have a lot of lusty desires. How can we understand immediately satisfied? Well, we have to understand that they were not fully in Krishna consciousness. If they were actually in contact with Krishna consciousness properly, then their lusty desires would be satisfied. And if people are not satisfied, then it means they're not properly situated in Krishna consciousness. It's that simple. It's not, just, it's not just anybody who comes to the Krishna Consciousness Movement will experience relief from all lusty desires. But they have to take up the process seriously. They have to follow. They have to do it properly. But certainly there's no, there's no doubt in the efficacy of the Krishna Consciousness process. It's going to work. It's going to take effect. But they have to follow properly. And if they do it properly, uh, then immediately they'll feel the effect. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So, the, the Palinda ladies, they reach perfection. The gopis are saying, the Palinda women, they have achieved perfection. We haven't. We want to inquire about the, what, what, what about their austerities? What did they do? You know? Why are they perfect? They took the dust from the feet of such a great devotee. Where did this kumkum come from? It came from the breast of his beloved Radha, Srimati Radharani. Then the, the gopis say, we are desiring to praise her good fortune, but we're not so bold. Instead, we just praise the Pulinda women. Actually, we should praise Srimati Radharani. It's her dust. But we're praising the Pulinda women. <laughs> we don't want to give too much attention to Srimati Radharani. And the Pulinda ladies, they didn't give, any, didn't give any proper respect. What did they do? They just took the, 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 the dust and they smeared it on themselves. 
They found it on the grass and they covered their faces and their breasts with it. So what would happen if they saw Krishna? If they actually saw Krishna, then they would also want to get the fragrance of Krishna's body. They would want to enjoy, just as Radha was enjoying with Krishna. So thinking like that, they were, they, the Palinda ladies, they were also thinking about being enjoyed by Krishna. So in this way they were able to actually get relief from their lusty desires. Because they were thinking, taking that dust, putting it over their bodies, that they, were, they, they imagined themselves that they are being enjoyed by Krishna. So the gopis say, we have not received that dust even once. That kumkum has a special power in it, but in all our births we have not received it even once. <laughs> all right, so we go ahead, text number? 18. 18, yes. Delighted Maharaj. Yes, please. Antaya Madrid Abhala Haridasa Vario Yadrama Krishna Charana Sparasha Pramodha Manam Tanoti Sahago Gana Yostar Tayoriad Pani at Pani Asuyava Sakandarat Kandamulai Kandamulai Yes Of all the devotees this Govardhan hill is the best. Oh my friends, this hill supplies Krishna and Balram, along with their calves, cows and cowherd friends, with all kinds of necessities, water for drinking, very soft grass, caves, fruits, flowers and vegetables. In this way, the hill offers respects to the Lord being touched by the by the lotus feet of Krishna and Balram, Govardhana Hill appears very jubilant. Purpose? Yes, please. This translation is quoted from Srila Prabhupada's Chaitanya Charita Amrita Madhya Lila 18.34. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains the opulence of Govardhana Hill as follows. Pani refers to the fragrant cool water from the Govardhana waterfalls which Krishna and Balram drink and use to wash their feet and mouths. Govardhana also offers other beverages such as honey, mango juice and pilu juice. Suyavasa indicates durva grass used to make the religious offerings of argya Govardhana also has grass that is frag fragrant, soft and conducive to the strong growth of cows and increased production of milk. This is, this uh, thus, this grass is used for feeding the transcendental herds, Kandara. Ah, <laughs> very good, thank you. All right, so Govardhan is described here by the gopis. Haridasa Varyao, of course, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he went to Vrindavan and when he was going around Govardhan Hill, he would sing this verse. This verse was chanted by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as he walked around the Govardhan Hill. So the next time you go, get the chance to go around Govardhan Hill or when you're doing Govardhan Puja, you can remember this verse. This is a nice verse to chant and teach everyone the glories of Govardhan Hill. How Govardhan Hill is Haridasavaryo, 
the greatest, the best of all the servants of Lord Hari. And in Srimad Bhagavatam, there are three people actually who are called Hari Das. There's Maharaj Yudhisthira, and there's Uddhava, and there's Govardhan Hill. And of the three, it's Govardhan Hill who is the best. He's, he's not just Hari Das, but he's Hari Das of Aryo. He's the best of all the devotees of Lord Hari. Why is he the best? Well, it's described in this verse. All the wonderful service which he's doing. All the nice grass which he grows on the Govardhan Hill, which is for the cows there as they graze on Govardhan Hill. And originally there were waterfalls on the Govardhan Hill and the cows could, and the, Krishna and Balaram would drink the water and be refreshed and they could bathe their feet and they could do Akshman and they could do Argya, everything. The, the, the water was very pure. Not only that, but there were fruits growing on the trees. Fruits like uh, mango, and pilu, and there were many nectarian drinks also. Different fruit drinks were also available there. Honey was also flowing from some of the trees. And then there was also the uh, roots, the mula and the kanda different kinds of roots which grow there and Krishna would eat these roots. I told you the other day about them, right? The mula and the kunda, these kind of things which grow in the ground there. And, and they would, in, the, in that, this particular time of the year, autumn, when Krishna would come there, they would be soft and the cowherd boys, they would enjoy eating these things. And the cows would enjoy also to come to Govardhan Hill because nice grass there, very good grass and also nice water to drink. But not only that, there were other things as well. There were caves there to give shelter from the heat or from the rain. And there's also the gully where the gopis used to have to cross to go through to cross the, to go over then to go to the market to sell their wares. There was the Dana Keli, right, where Krishna would perform that pastime taking tax from the gopis to go through to cross the Govardhan Hill. And these stones on the Govardhan Hill are very, very special. That in the summer, when it's very hot, the stones are cool. But in the winter, in the cold weather, the stones are warm. So the stones are very kind and they, they reciprocate, taking care of the gopi, taking care of the devotees, not giving any pain to the, gopi, to, the, to the devotees as they walk around the Govardhan hill. And now also it is warm. Now it's now the stones are warm. Yes, if you walk around Govardhan, the stones they don't get very cold. Other stones will be very cold, but the, the stones from Govardhan, they they're not so cold. Of course, we don't usually like to walk on the Govardhan hill. We won't like to walk. We walk around the Govardhan hill. So even the stones, we wouldn't, we wouldn't walk so much on the stones, right? We're going to walk around them. Like mud. And Krishna could put his lotus footprint into the stone. And there's a stone like that with Krishna's lotus footprint. And you could see the marks also of Krishna's lotus feet there and the stone of Govardhan. So that's the nature of the stones in Govardhan, that they can become soft like mud just for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. And we see also if you go to uh, Alalanath, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would 
go to Alalanath when there was no darshan of Lord Jagannath. When Lord Jagannath, after the bathing of Jagannath, then there's no darshan for two weeks. So at that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would go to Alalanath and he would stay there. And there, you can see on the floor there how the floor melted in contact with the body of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How the stone also, the stones there in the temple became soft due to the touch of the body of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So also the Govardhan stone, also particular stone is there. I think that there was one stone Krishna personally gave to Sanatana Goswami because Sanatana Goswami, he had the program that every day he would walk around Govardhan Hill and he got old and it became very troublesome, but still he would not give up. So Lord Krishna took sympathy on him and Lord Krishna appeared to Sanatana Goswami and told him that now you're old, you don't need to do this. But he said, no, I have to do it, I should do it. So then Lord Krishna gave him a stone from Govardhan Hill. He put his footprint in it and then gave it to Sanatana. He said, you simply walk around this stone and this is as good as going around the whole Govardhan Hill. So that stone is still worshipped today, right? Where is it worshipped? Radha Damada Temple in Vrindavan. Yes, right. You can see it there. Mm. So Govardhan, the very best of all the devotees and the, the best of all the mountains and best of all the devotees of Lord Hari, mm. surrounded by so many wonderful holy places. As you go around Govardhan Hill, it's, it, it, it's, it's just so amazing. There's so many things to see. There's so many things to talk about when you go around the Govardhan Hill that you can never get enough time. So we want to appreciate anyway. The gopis certainly appreciated the glories of Govardhan Hill. And they're, they're talking actually. They said, we should go to Govardhan Hill because we will see Krishna there. And there'll be... Uh, it will be a good chance for us to actually see Krishna because we, we've not seen Krishna. We want to see Krishna. So if we go to Govardhan, he's probably there with the cows and we'll see him there. We'll be able to have his darshan. Okay. So Govardhan, the best of all the devotees of Lord Hari. The identity of Govardhan is interesting, that we say Govardhan is Krishna, but he's also a devotee of Krishna. He's not just simply a devotee and he's not just Krishna, he's both. He's both Krishna and he's Krishna's devotee. That's how I heard it explained anyway, that Govardhan is both the devotee and he's also Krishna. Krishna himself assumes the form of Govardhan Hill and he accepts all the offerings, of course. And we don't walk on the Govardhan Hill. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us that. And the Lord of Govardhan is Hari Dev, the deity of Hari Dev. A wonderful temple to go and see. When you go to Govardhan, go and see Hari Dev. All right, so we'll go ahead with just a text 19. Who would like to read text 19? Uh, can I do it? Please, Prabhu. Gagopakairanuvanam nayaturudara Venusvanai kalapadaisthanu bhrushtu sakya Aspandanam gati matam pulakas tarunam nir yoga pasha kruta lakshana yor vichitram. My dear friends, as Krishna and Balarama passed through the forest with their cowherd friends leading their cows, they carry ropes to bind the cows' rear legs at the time of milking. When Lord Krishna plays on his flute, the sweet music causes the moving living entities to become stunned and the non-moving trees to tremble with ecstasy. These things are certainly very wonderful. 
Hmm. Purport. Krishna and Balaram would sometimes wear their covering ropes on their heads and sometimes carry them on their shoulders. And thus, they were, they were beautifully decorated with all the equipment of cowherd boys. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur explains that the ropes of Krishna and Balarama are made of yellow cloth and have clusters of pearls at both ends. Sometimes they wear these ropes around their turbans and the ropes thus become wonderful decorations. Mm-hmm. All right, so the, the word there's mentioned there, this near yoga pasha, the ropes for binding the rear legs of the cows. Sometimes when you're milking a cow, <laughs> it's one of the dangers in milking the cows, that sometimes the cows will kick you. So you have to be very careful when you're going to milk a cow. Some cows are not so gentle, and if you get kicked by the cow, then it, it can, it's very painful. We were hearing Naraini, she was telling that Radhanath Maharaj was, when he, before he took sannyas, he was often taking care of cows and milking cows. So there was one cow who was very difficult to milk, so they decided what they'd do, they'd tie her legs tie both legs, not just one, tie both legs. And so they tied up both legs and when he went to milk her, the cow went to kick and she fell over. And she fell over on top of him. <laughs> and the cow fell on top of him and they had to, the devotees had to come and somehow move the cow to get Radhanath out from underneath the cow. <laughs> and and he, he described that when he got out, he said he looked at the cow and she looked at him and she said, if you ever do that again, <laughs> don't you ever do that again or else I'll really get you, I'll really let you have it. <laughs> so milking cows is, <laughs> it, it, it's uh, not surprising in some ways why, be, you know, it became, it's become a mechanized industry which is not good. If we want the milk, of course, people like vegans, they won't drink milk, but we argue that milk is actually very important food and it is necessary for the development of the brain. The people like vegans, they argue against that. They say, no, it's very cruel, you take the milk from the cows, it's meant for the calves, but it's not meant for the calves at, after a certain point. And not too much should be given to the calves. For some time you give the milk to the calves, and, but, and, but not too much, otherwise they will get sick. And the, the calves also have to eat grass, learn to eat grass and chew grass. So the vegans say they don't like this. And, and veganism somehow has become a, quite popular around the world. Many people have taken to this vegan diet. But we're we're lacto-vegetarians. We use milk products. And we say milk is actually given, it's a gift of God, that the cow eats grass and she gives milk. So in order to get the milk, you have to milk. And it's much nicer to milk the cows by hand than to milk them by some machine. You put the cows under some machine, you attach it to machine, then these machines, they completely drain every drop of blood out from the cow. We have to understand that cow's milk is the transformation of the blood of the cow. Prabhupada would sometimes tell us that people want to eat meat because they like the taste of blood. So Prabhupada would explain that actually the proper way to taste the blood is drink milk. Milk is the transformation of the blood of the cow. And we get milk when, the, when you milk the cow. You, have, you milk the cows. And some cows, they, they give milk for many years. And it's not that they always have to have calves in order to give milk. Generally, that's the rule, that they need calves to give milk. But there are cows which will give milk without any calf. They're very, very pious cows, Kamadenu cows. 
So Krishna and Balaram, they were as young boys, they were in the, there's this uh, mood of taking care of the cows. When they were young children, young children and growing up, they were in uh, Vatsavyaras, they were being taken care of by their mother and father. But then they start to grow up a little bit and they're more with the boys, the cowherd boys and so on. That's Sakyaras. But as they get a bit more grown up still, they come to Madhuryaras and they enjoy the pastimes with the, with the, with the gopis. That Krishna has his gopis, and Balarama, he has also his gopis, different, different groups of gopis, not the same. Whenever Krishna is with Srimati Radharani, then Balaram will not be there. If Balaram is there, then Radharani can never come. We were hearing like that. They said, Oh, Krishna's with Balaram. Our mission is defeated. The gopis cannot go to see Krishna when Balaram is there with him because Krishna's in the mood. A different ras, he's in Sakya ras, he's enjoying being with his friends. But when the gopis, when the gopis come, it has to be Krishna on his own. So it's, it's very wrong if you put Gornitai with Radha and Krishna. Gornitai shouldn't be on the altar with Radha and Krishna. They have to have separate altars. So that's why we see one altar for Gornitai, one altar for Radha Krishna, another altar for Krishna Balaram. Different rasas. All right, we'll go ahead. We just finish off the final text. Who would like to read final text for us? Bimal Prabhu. Mm -hmm. All right. If Evam Vidhapu Vato Tavindavarna Charina Varna Yanto Mito Gopya Tirastan Mayatam Yayu. Yes, right. Translation. Thus narrating uh, to one another the playful pastimes of the Supreme Personality of God as he wandered about in the Vrindavan forest, the gopis became fully absorbed in thoughts of him. Mm -hmm. I'll read the purport. Shilu, in this regard, Srila Prabhupada comments, this is the perfect example of Krishna consciousness to somehow or other remain always engrossed in thoughts of Krishna. The vivid example is always present in the behavior of the gopis. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya declared that no one can worship the Supreme Lord by any method that is better than the method of the gopis. The gopis were not born in very high brahmana or kshatriya families, they were born in the families of Vaishyas and not in big mercantile communities, but in the families of cowherd men. They were not very well educated, although they heard all sorts of knowledge from the Brahmanas, the authorities of Vedic knowledge. The gopis' only purpose was to remain always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Thus then, the purports of the humble servants of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 21st chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Gopis Glorify the Song of Krishna's Flute. So this final text is like a summary of what's been taught throughout the the chapter. Lord Krishna had come to the forest of Vrindavan and the gopis were absorbed and thought of him. And we're hearing how they think of Krishna. We're heard about their different 
feelings towards the flute particularly the, and we heard the effect of the flute how the flute the sound of the flute affected all the different living entities all over the creation from the the birds to the in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Sanatana Goswami also talks about the bees, how the bees are also affected, and many and the different creepers and plants, how they are affected. We heard about the rivers, how they were affected. And we heard some gopis, some of the gopis obviously were they were married because they were talking about their husbands that we are very unfortunate if even a fragrance of Krishna comes there, my husband gets very angry, the husband can get violent even. So obviously some of the gopis were married. We are hearing their, their different moods and remembering Krishna, the different emotions, hearing the sound of Krishna. And we heard, then we heard just now the glories of Govardhan Hill and how Govardhan Hill is very, very dear to Lord Krishna. And that Lord Krishna would go there almost daily and he would take his cows there and they would enjoy. Many pastimes took place at Govardhan Hill. So in this way, the gopis were describing the glories of Lord Krishna's flute. Okay, are there any final questions? Or comments from anyone? Maharaj, may I ask something, Maharaj? Yes, please, Maharaji. Um, Maharaj, I heard that anyone who is uh, enemical towards Krishna, they are not allowed entry in Vrindavan. So um, I was wondering about the husbands of these gopis uh, who are uh, who become angry even if there is some smell from Krishna like that. So how do we understand it correctly, Maharaj? Thank you. Well, they may they may not actually be in Vrindavan, you see, they're not actually seeing Vrindavan. Although there are residents there in that place, they're simply in Vrindavan on the map. They're not actually in the holy place. You see, there are many people who live in Vrindavan and they think of Vrindavan as just some place on the map. Srila Prabhupada used to tell us, you don't enter Vrindavan just by buying a ticket. And so it's not just, and I, I quoted also Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he's saying who is actually a Vrajbasi, it's people who actually walk as devotees. They will chant the holy name of Krishna and they will glorify Krishna and they'll hear the glories of Krishna. They're the actual bridge buses. These other people, they may be living in some physical place which is on the map, but they're not actually seeing the holy dam. The holy dam is covered for them. But it's true. Without being devotees, they're not allowed in admit, admittance into the Holy Land. And that's true also in Jagannath Puri. Uh, one time there was a big atheist came there in Jagannath Puri. And the head priest came and he, he told him, go, get out of here. You're not allowed here. Lord Jagannath said, you cannot stay here. You get out from this top, please. So certainly Vrindavan to actually enter into Vrindavan, we have to develop the mood like Akrura. As Akrura went to Vrindavan, what was his mood in going to Vrindavan to see Krishna? So we have to develop that kind of attitude to actually enter into the Holy Dham. We have to change the consciousness. It's not enough just to be there, just to take birth. You may take birth there. Who is actually the Dham Vasis? So we have to see the consciousness. But still, we, we, will, we would respect them. We, we have to respect everyone. And the fact that they're husbands of a gopi, then that's very great fortune, right? That, that they may, may not be devotees, but at least their wives are great devotees. So certainly they're, 
they must have some kind of special mercy to have that opportunity to be with a devotee who is a very dear devotee to Lord Krishna. I was thinking about the cows being in Vatsalya Ras. It was mentioned also that when Lord Brahma stole away all the cows and cowherd boys, at that time Lord Krishna took the place of all the cows and cowherd boys. And that time Lord Krishna would go to the, all the different ladies because they were the mothers of the cowherd boys and Lord Krishna would drink their milk. So all the ladies in Vrindavan, they were all like Krishna's mother. But m more than that, they, they have that love for Krishna, right? That the, the Vatsalya Ras is only a part of it, but the people in Vrindavan, they're more in, it's all Madhurya Ras. They have this, so much attraction and attachment to Krishna, that they love Krishna so much. They cannot stop thinking of him. They cannot, they cannot give him up at any point. Everything he does, every moment, every th action, that it is so pleasing and it, it, and it stays with them and enters the hearts of the gopis, enters the hearts of all these devotees, all these people in Vrindavan who are seeing Krishna. The birds, somehow, they close their eyes, they don't look, but they hear the sound of the flute. So the sound of the flute. Sound is important, right? It's sound. Prabhupada said, we don't give so much attention to seeing. Hearing is important. Sometimes people say, I want to see God. If God is there, I want to see him. Prabhupada said, why do you want to see? Why can't you hear? He's speaking to you. He's speaking Bhagavad Gita, he's speaking scripture, every day he's speaking, you can hear. Why don't you hear him? And so we have to purify ourselves by hearing, then it will become more appreciative of actually seeing Krishna. We don't see Krishna with the eyes, you have to see Krishna with the heart. There's a story, the blind man wanted to go and see Krishna and his friend said, why, you, you, you won't see anything, you can't see Krishna. He said, I want Krishna to see me. So the idea is to be seen by Krishna. Krishna is the seer, we're the seen, we have to be seen. But Krishna is the actual seer. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati used to speak on that point a lot. To be, to be seen by Krishna, not to be the seer. All right, so thank you very much for your association. And I hope you all have a very nice uh, Bhaktivedanta. I hope the rest of the course will go very well for you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to share whatever, whatever little bit I know <laughs> I, I certainly learned a lot from your association. So thank you all very much and wish you good luck with the rest of the course. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Gore back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna.